The Transformers PS2 game is released in May 2004. There's an animated series and a comic book of the same name, and all of these were released to promote the Transformers Armada toy line. As a PS2 tie-in game to an early 2000s toy line, the Transformers game really has no business being as good as it is. There is a level of consideration that I just don't think anybody would rightfully expect from, I mean, what is basically just an advert for toys. I don't think enough people really talk about how Transformers on the PS2 is pretty much the only Transformers game that even gets close to feeling like playing with toys. I'm just going to assume that you don't know anything about Transformers. So Transformers is a toy line that was created by Takara of Japan and Hasbro in the early 1980s. It's all about robots who transform into vehicles or cassette players or guns or whatever. And the main story conceit is that there are two tribes of Transformers who have been at war with each other on their own planet for literally millions of years. And then they come to Earth because just, just buy the toys, all right? We don't need to justify ourselves to you people, okay? Pretty much from the off, Transformers became Hasbro's hottest property. Over the years that have come since, the Transformers have been through several iterations, and generally speaking, due to complications either with the ongoing story and also sometimes with the actual toys themselves, I would say that the Transformers popularity has been inconsistent. I don't know if you remember, but the early 2000s was a hotbed for mining nostalgia and all this stuff from the 1980s. Mattel rebooted Masters of the Universe in the summer of 2002. Playmates rebooted Turtles in 2003. And then sort of nestled between these two, Hasbro rebooted Transformers as Transformers Armada around Christmas 2002. This was backed by an animated series, there was a Dreamwave comic book, and eventually there was the PS2 game that I'm talking about today. Transformers Armada was intended to be a big reboot, so they were going to bring back legacy characters, reset all the continuity, and really just kind of start everything again. So we've got the story of the Autobots and the Decepticons being at war for millennia, no change there. But Armada added a third tribe of Transformers. These guys are called the Minicons. Minicons are little Robert friends who can connect up to the bigger Transformers. They unlock like hidden powers that are hidden away inside the Transformers, but in practicality, they unlock new play features in the toys. The story in the comic book and the cartoon and in the PS2 game is actually different, so there's no consistency between them, but the, the basic concept is basically the same. It's just about the Autobots and the Decepticons racing around planet Earth to find the Minicons and then to recruit them to their side. Transformers on PS2 was developed by Melbourne House, who were previously known as Beam Software. Now, their pedigree can't really be knocked for driving games, but their history of 3D action games might give you cause for alarm. <laughs> Development of the game started in January 2003, straight after the toys launched in the shops. Right from the beginning, the studio head, Andrew Carter, he said that Melbourne House's approach was going to be to translate Transformers Armada into a good PS2 game. There was no real intention to make this a tie-in, but actually just to make something good that stands entirely by itself. Apparently, Hasbro had absolutely no qualms about this. They enforced no canon restrictions. There was no obligation to tie into some storyline or whatever. So there was no need for the player to know anything before going into the game, which is perfect actually. You can come into this blind, you don't need to know anything about Transformers at all. And aside from a couple of really obscure references to the 1986 animated film, the game just gives you everything you need in order for it to tell its own story. Carter also then said that while the toy line and the cartoon was going to be for kids, Melbourne House's game was going to be deliberately made for like your 20 to 30 year olds. This is what Carter called the PS2 market. I reckon that this has got to be one of the first instances of a company taking something that was originally for kids and then remaking it specifically for adults. This is something that we saw loads more of in the 2000s and obviously it's like super common now, but I really think this is maybe the first time this ever happened. One nice little feature that I do like though is they got the original voice actors from the cartoon. So they got David Kay and Gary Chalk as Megatron and Optimus Prime. Absolutely fantastic. And best of all, Red Alert is voiced by Spotswood from Team America. Gary has already proven to me that he is 100% committed to the team. He proved it last night by sucking my cock. 
So I wanted to talk about this game today because I just genuinely love Transformers. I have been collecting Transformers since I was about 17 and the Armada toy line is actually one of my personal highlights. This game is one of very few genuinely good Transformers games and it is actually my personal favourite Transformers game because, I mentioned before, this is the only game that nails the toyetic sensibility of the Transformers toys. So the first time you boot into the game, the first decision that you are asked is which one of your toys do you want to play with? You've got three to choose from. This isn't a permanent decision. You can always come back and pick and choose between these three Autobots pretty much on the fly, actually. Apparently, during the development of this game, Melbourne House had actually planned to have even more playable characters here, but in the end, the, it was essentially just deemed to be too much work. So the three that we have here is the three that we got. Optimus Prime is the Uncle Muscles of the group. You know, he's a, a slow-moving hunk but he's a pow 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 hard hitting guy. Red Alert is the balanced every Robert and then on the other end of the spectrum you've got Hotshot aka Kid Speedy. He's super zippy but he can't take a lot of punishment. You'd be forgiven for looking at this character and thinking wait a minute isn't that Bumblebee? And no, <laughs> this is not an oversight. There is a very specific reason why Bumblebee is not in this game and by all rights, he should be. The TLDR version is basically toy companies very, very rarely trademarked anything back in the day because toy lines really didn't last that long. And because nostalgia didn't really get invented until the 2000s, Hasbro just didn't bother to trademark a whole bunch of their character names. And when they went rebooting everything for Armada, they basically found out that Bumblebee had been taken. I have actually made a much bigger video about this because it's actually a pretty funny story, but suffice to say, they still wanted a plucky little yellow guy, so they ended up creating a new character called Hotshot. That's a really interesting thing, right? Anyway, back to it. So you play as one of these three Autobots, you chip about Earth fighting Decepticons and looking for the hidden Minicons. Each level has got a bunch of stuff to find, it's got a bunch of baddies to shoot, there's a few scripted events, and then there's usually an end of level boss. On the face of it, it doesn't really sound like there's a huge amount going on here, but for me, the game experience is deepened and it feels that much more authentic because of that toyetic sense that I had mentioned earlier. I keep saying that this game feels like toys, so let's actually break this down. Firstly, I think it's super important to mention that Melbourne House captured a lot of detail to bring the toys into the game, and the decision to make the game third person, I think then puts the toys, I mean literally, front and center. It should be mentioned actually that these are really faithful recreations of the actual toys as well. The shapes, the silhouettes, the colors of the toys themselves are, are really, really well done. They are these big sort of chunky robots, they all have this really heavy sense of weight. They all move quite sluggishly and there's a really noticeable acceleration curve when you're moving around, especially if you want to compare this to other action games from the early 2000s. But I think that this keeps the focus on the fact that you are playing with a chunky robot friend and the game controls are really smooth and responsive in spite of the fact that these are really heavy feeling characters. In fact, the platforming and the controls are so good, I often forget that this is a Transformers game and like their one main gimmick is that they can transform into cars. Aside from just making you zip around the level a bit faster, I like the fact that the devs went to the effort of adding like little ramps and stuff everywhere so you can take your robot off some sweet jumps. I'll be honest, outside of that, the car mode actually has very little utility. You can't shoot in car mode and most of the environments do actually feel more suited to running and gunning. It might perhaps be a little bit half-baked in regards to the game's design, but also it's just fun and that's kind of the point. If anything, this just reinforces the notion that you're playing with a toy. There doesn't actually need to be any logic to this, as long as you're just having fun. And well, I am. So speaking of the environments, the levels themselves are all kind of largely based on real places like the Amazon, Alaska, Antarctica, but none of them are actually trying to be faithful or realistic recreations of these places. They're romanticized interpretations of real world places in the same way that a duvet thrown over some sofa cushions might form the hills of the Amazon basin or a sheepskin rug can play the snowy tundras of Alaska. It's clear that this world was designed around the concept of play instead of the idea of realism. The levels are laid out to give you cool things to do, almost like a childlike caricature or a cartoon version of a real place. 
I do think it's funny that you're given very few reminders that humans actually exist here. Uh, I found myself a few times like running around in the jungles or crossing these massive wooden bridges, going through tunnels and pyramids and whatever, and then all of a sudden you'll see like a little house or like a little boat or something, and I'm, and I'm like, oh, who are all these tiny little people? <laughs> and then the veil lifts and I remember, oh yeah, no, these are actually normal humans. I'm playing a giant 40 foot ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because despite that, every location you visit in this game is scaled to make sure that a 40 foot tall robot can fit through the doors and fit over the bridges. So again, it's not trying to be realistic, it's just giving you a fun place to play. Exploring these locations is really what yields Transformers' best and most unique play feature, and that is the Minicons. Finding the Minicons isn't just a story conceit, in fact, in an absolute chad move, Melbourne House used this play feature from the toys to also inform the game's core loop. In practical terms, the Minicons are these tiny scaled down Transformers that can connect up to the larger main Robert characters. The term Hasbro used for this is Power Links with an X, because this is the 2000s. And as a play feature, Power Linksing activates hidden abilities for each of the individual toys. I'll show you what I mean here with some of my own Transformer toys. So you can see here that the missiles in Demolisher's shoulders are actually locked in place and they can only be activated and fired by connecting a Minicon which actually physically unlocks the mechanism inside the toy. This was the same for most of the toys in the Armada toy line. They all had these hidden weapons or sometimes even whole transformation gimmicks will only be unlocked once a Minicon was connected. In the cartoon and the comic books, the Minicons were pegged as being the key to winning the war because they revealed all these secret powers that were hidden deep within the Transformers. Now, the way that Melbourne House translated that into the game is slightly different. They instead made the Minicons utilitarian items like guns or shields or rocket launchers and, and that kind of stuff. So finding new Minicons and then clonking them onto your Autobots is kind of like finding new gear rather than being anything more esoteric. When you do find a new Minicon, you can either use them straight away or you can store them in the HQ. And what's really nice here is you're always free just to dip out of a mission, change your bar, experiment with your Minicon loadout. It really feels like you are able to play the game the way that you want. Definitely worth mentioning, the game's action all happens on the L and R buttons. <laughs> When I've spoken about 2000s games before, I definitely have mentioned that when these games were getting made, a lot of the conventions that we take for granted now hadn't really been fully established. Games from this era always feel really experimental and really creative to me, and Transformers is no exception to that. But the controls for Transformers might feel a little bit weird if you come into it cold compared to today's games. Jump is on L1 and you fire your rifle and melee with R1. L2 and R2 will change depending on what you've got assigned to them, but it will range from shields, rocket launchers, vision upgrades, that kind of stuff. There's all kinds of stuff that you can add and find throughout the game that will really extend the way that you play the game and the time that you spend in it. Each of the Minicons has like an Energon cost and each Autobot has a rating, like an upper limit of how much Energon they can take. So you can't take all the best Minicons all the time. Initially, I thought this was quite limiting, but I actually think this is super good. This stops you stagnating by just putting the four absolute best Minicons on there and then just never changing them out again. This way, I, it encourages more regular and more ongoing experimentation. There is synergy between Minicons of the same colour which rewards you with extra health. This becomes pretty much necessary on later levels and I think that this helps to deepen that conceit of the Autobot Minicon synergy in a way that even the toy line couldn't really manage. The Transformers PS2 game really comes into its own once you've found a good chunk of these Minicons. The real meat of the game, really, is revisiting each level after you've cleared it, searching for all the leftover Minicons that are hidden around the place. Gliding through the air, searching for Minicons with your Minicon detector, it's just such a chill vibe and it's just so much fun. But it also makes a lot of sense in terms of the gameplay, because the game does actually get quite a lot harder as you go through it, so you will need all that additional upgraded armour and all those additional guns in order to keep up with the game. 
you'll probably end up playing as Optimus Prime in the later levels because they are just packed with all the hardest enemies and big slow chonky Prime is the smartest option. He can take so much damage, he gives so much in return. Still though, judicious use of your Minicons is really the biggest factor between victory and defeat in this game. Transformers took 12 months to develop. By the time the game came out, the Armada toyline was actually already wrapping up. Hasbro were preparing to launch their next big Transformers toyline, Energon. In fact, in some territories, this game was actually called Transformers Armada Prelude to Energon. It was essentially a farewell to the Armada toyline and an introduction to the next phase of what Hasbro would eventually call the Unicron Trilogy. As testament to this, once you've defeated Megatron in his volcano lair, the final reveal is a big surprise showdown against the giant planet-eating robot Unicron. Unicron being another example of Hasbro mining the 80s nostalgia here, he was the big bad guy in the 1986 animated film, but there never was a toy of Unicron. So why would you put Unicron in this game? Well, because late in 2003, as a total surprise to everyone, Hasbro announced the first ever Unicron action figure. This thing blew minds back in 2003, let me tell you. I mean, I was one of them. Unicron was in fact the last figure released in the Armada toy line, and being honest, was almost certainly aimed at all the man children everywhere who had always wanted a Unicron toy. To promote this giant hunk of plastic nostalgia, the cartoon and comic book both did an enormous right turn, with Unicron just turning up right at the end as the big bad guy. It would probably stand to reason that Hasbro would also stipulate that their giant planet gobbling Robo Satan should appear in the PS2 game too. Not gonna lie, this final encounter does feel pretty tacked on. It is the only time in the entire game that I got that whole like, to sell toys vibe. But also, I'm flying around space with a jetpack, fighting a giant robot planet, so it's rad as f Transformers did extremely well on release. It got wicked reviews in all the popular magazines of the time. Even playing it now, I still have that same kind of reverence. The game's native frame rate is absolutely rock solid, even with all these rag dolls and explosions and all this stuff happening on screen. I should say though, the Transformers PS2 game has a ton of these pretty gnarly post-processing effects. I really dig this aesthetic when I'm looking at this game in screenshots, but I disabled as much of it as I could in the emulation. I've put my PSX2 settings in the description of this video if you want to recreate my setup. It's not like it's game-breakingly bad with all this left on though, being honest. On the subject of emulation, this game was actually released exclusively on PS2 and it's never been reissued on any other platform since. So the only way that you're gonna play this is by finding a physical disc. So then you're either gonna be playing that on original hardware or you're gonna be ripping it and running it in an emulator. I've been wrong before, but I think it's unlikely that this game will ever be for sale again. So I would say downloading a ROM probably does no damage to anyone. 20 plus years later, Transformers is still Hasbro's flagship franchise. There's been a whole bunch of Transformers games since this, and they're all pretty good. But none of them recreate the toyetic sensation of playing with a transforming robot quite like Transformers on the PS2. By being so closely connected to a real toy line and by delving into what makes transforming robots so cool, I think this game stands alone as the best Transformers game ever made. Thank you very much for watching this overly gushy video about an old PlayStation game based on some toys. I had a lot of fun making this one. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. And if you also like games and other weird stuff from the turn of the millennium, then please subscribe and I'll see you all in the next video. All right, ta-da.